Hello booktube. I have a Friday mega stuff video for you here. For all of you who are new to the channel, that is when I take a whole bunch of tedious little things and bush them together into a tedious big thing. <laughs> uh, all sorts of little subject headings that might not make a video of their own unless that video was 90% ranting and who needs that. <laughs> so I thought we'd run down a short list of them and I want to start off with the grimmest one. I want to start off with the one that isn't fun. So that we start off there, we have nowhere to go but up, we can go on to happier stuff. And that is the uh, the U.S. elections here in 2020. I've had a squintillion emails from you all. I leave my email on every video. Feel free to email me about any subject. I'll help if I can. I'm certainly willing to chat. Uh, as long as you acknowledge that I get hundreds of emails a day. So it might I might not be able to get back to you immediately. And if you write 5,000 words, I won't be able to respond with 5,000 words, anything over 1,000 words, and you're going to need to meet my daily pay rate. <laughs> uh, but most of you, all of you have been great about that. And uh, I've had a squintillion emails asking me what my opinions are on the 2020 elections for Senate, Congress, for the, the U.S. presidency here in America. And... Uh, uh, it's a grim subject. I'll try not to go on at great length about it. Uh, there's still a lot about this election that is in doubt, famously the top of the ticket. Uh, but there's one thing that isn't in doubt uh, about what this election tells us, and it's a very bad thing. And it aligns itself with the advice that I've been giving on this channel for almost a year now. I'm going to give that advice at the end of this little peroration. Uh, but first I want to say what that thing is, and you already know it if you've been paying any attention to this election. Uh, and that is the electorate's choices. The choice of the electorate is not in doubt. The choice of the electorate has been clear since the first exit polls, and is getting clearer and clearer by the hour. And that is that millions more Americans in 2020 voted for the Nazi party knowing what it is and what it does than voted for it in 2016 when they maybe didn't know what it was. Having had the full nature of that party portrayed in front of it for four years, having lost family members, friends, jobs, an economy, their health, their grandparents, having lost everything, Millions more Americans opted for that intentionally, wide, wide open eyes, in 2020 than did in 2016. And that underscores what I think is the essential takeaway from this election, regardless of what, of, you know, whether or not a family in suburban Pennsylvania can be found to tip the scales in favor of one politician over another. And the, that realization is that this is mostly a Nazi country. It has been comfortable for the last hundred years, maybe even longer than that, uh, to say otherwise. It's been comfortable to watch the evening news to get all up in arms about Nazis marching in Skokie because it's on the evening news and Walter Cronkite is sniffing about it. Because it was easy to think, all right, this is a tiny fraction of a fraction. This is the lunatic fringe. That is not true. Who knows how long it hasn't been true, but it isn't true anymore. In a country of 350 million people, at least 150 million people are perfectly okay with the country being run by Nazis. And those of you who may think that I'm being hyperbolic uh, probably haven't been paying a whole lot of attention either, right? Because we have naked white supremacy. We have America uber alles as the ethos of the government. We have loyalty oaths to the leader instead of to the Constitution being implemented on all levels of government. We have concentration camps. We have heavily armed brown shirts patrolling the streets of major cities. Again, loyal only to the leader and not to the Republic. The only thing that's missing is hyperactive militarization and effing armbands. And those things are coming. This percentage, where 51, 52, 53% of the country is Nazi, those percentages don't ever go down naturally. This is not a peaks and troughs type thing. This is not, it just so happens that we're in a period of American history in which white nationalism and fascism are in the vogue 
but that other periods will come in which they are once again relegated to the extremes. That doesn't happen. And any of you who are students of history will know that. When it gets, when the percentages get up this high, they just keep going up until the worst happens. And that is, that brings me to uh, the advice that I mentioned uh, that I've been giving you for almost a year now. I'm going to give it again. Those of you who are just writing it off as hyperbole or just saying it doesn't involve me, uh, are going to do that anyway. And those of you who are students of history or who are watching American history unfold from elsewhere, from outside of this, from outside of this country, uh, are already going to know this or, and largely agree with it. So in a way, this is wasted talk, but I'll do it anyway, because so many of you have been, have asked, I thought it deserved a response on camera. And that advice is simple. Leave. If you are in America now, you should leave as soon as possible. And I don't mean a vacation. I mean, emigrate if possible. And for a great number of you, it is possible. Do it today. If you've been sleeping on the whole subject and you need time to renew your passport and gather a few things together and maybe arrange some finances, fine, but make it a goal that you do it before the end of the year. The end of the year might be too long, but at least that, at the most that, you should emigrate immediately. Those of you who have the ability, dual citizenship, a, a community in some free country, should pack a bag and leave today. The one thing that is common that runs throughout the testimony of, of, that we have from people who live through the metamorphosis that the United States is currently going through, the one thread that runs through all those testimonies is how stunned they are even decades later at how fast it happened. That one day it was absolutely normal. They were in 1932 Germany and they were lower middle class and they were going about their jobs and their neighbors were smiling at them and they considered themselves to be relatively patriotic Germans who maybe had books at home and had grandparents at home and went through the rituals six times a year, but who certainly didn't consider themselves to be Jews first and Germans second and had no idea how many of those people who were smiling at them at the bank and the deli did consider them to be Jews and not Germans. And in 2020 America, if you're not a Nazi, you're a Jew. It's not just anti-Semitism towards Jews that is on the rise in this country, ably abetted by everyone in power. This is a, if you're not with us, you're against us type thing. This has happened before in many countries that slide into this kind of change. My point being, if you don't think it will affect you, you're dead wrong. And it's better to admit that than to end up being just plain dead. What you are facing is death for yourself and slavery for your children. So what you need to do is leave. You need to emigrate as soon as possible. You are in that point when you are reading a history of Germany and you are at 1933 and you are yelling at the page at these complacent Berliners saying, I know what's coming, and if you were paying attention, you would know what's coming too. Don't wait because you have a favorite book club, or because your retirement is only one year away, or because you're thinking about moving to a different suburb. Don't wait at all. You have friends in L.A.? Move right away. Grab what you can and move right away, because the gates are going to swing closed. And when they do, you won't be able to leave. You scream that at those people when you read those histories. You are now, if you are in America, you are now in that history. And I know a lot of you are thinking, well, no, it could go, it could go in the other direction. It, you know, uh, it, the, the voting hasn't been finished being counted yet. It could be that we're going to turn a page, all that sort of thing. Again, I want to point out the numbers you need to know, you already know. The numbers that aren't known as of this filming could be known later today or tomorrow. Who cares? They're, ir they're irrelevant. You already know the numbers that you need to know. Millions more Americans voted for the Nazi party in 2020 than did in 2016. You right now are living in a Nazi majority country. So you should leave, go to a free country as fast as you can. That, and that concludes the gloomy part of this mega stuff video. It's, I didn't mean to, wasn't going to mention it at all. Because I've already made this, I've already made this warning. It doesn't change if, if Joe Biden wins by one half of one electoral vote. 
That Nothing changes about that situation. It's the populace that I'm talking about. It's those armed brown shirts that I'm talking about. It's the four people behind you in line at the takeout place or at the bank or at the movie theater or at the bookstore. The four people behind you in line don't believe in the Constitution. They are loyal to the leader. And if he tells them to kill you, they will. They will. <laughs> I'm not talking metaphorically here. This is not hyperbole. If he tells them, those four people in line right behind you that look normal, if he tells them to kill you, he will. And if you don't support him, he will eventually tell them to kill you. If not him, then the next him. So I, want, I wanted to start, my advice hasn't changed, and the numbers only prove it. Millions more people voted in support of white nationalism, racism, anti-Semitism, Deutschland über alles, concentration camps. Millions more people voted in favor of that, in favor of anti-scientism for the general population and the latest science for the leader and his cabal of relatives and adherents. The latest science to keep them alive, to keep them healthy, to keep them prosperous. But they want you to distrust, the populace, to distrust all science. Take the populace back to the fourth century. Because an ignorant population is much easier to control. That's what they want you to believe that all science is fake. Unless it comes handed to you as a gift from them. And even then, it's them that's making it work. Not the science. It's It becomes a religion. Uh, and, I, won't, I will change the subject now. The point is, this has happened many times before. It is very clear. And you should take advantage of that. Forewarned is forearmed. So, that's that's my... that is, For those of you who are emailing me, that is my opinion on this subject. It is not hyperbole. To save yourself, you should leave immediately. If you can. Uh, if you can't, well, we'll all go through it together. So, those of us who can't. A lot of Americans, 70% of Americans, by some estimates live from paycheck to paycheck, and so aren't financially able to leave the country. If you're one of those, well, uh, okay. But a lot of people, including a lot of people listening to me right now, could leave right now, have an up-to-date passport, have traveled at some point in the last year, maybe have friends or a community or at least a couch in some free country. That's Those are the people I'm mostly directing these comments to, but we have we have other mega stuff stuff to talk to that that is happier. Uh, like for instance, uh, now that we're, we're done with that first part, I'll, if I remember, I will leave uh, one of those timestamp things. I can't do it technologically, but I could put it in the comments saying jump ahead to thirteen minutes if you want to avoid getting your blood pressure up. Uh, we'll we'll move on now to happier stuff, and we'll start with tech. <laughs> this is a tech channel, <laughs> the least likely tech channel on all of YouTube, <laughs> uh, but not. Lately, not the kind of tech that I usually talk about. I usually talk about iPads and Chromebooks and laptops because I've been fiddling around with that for years. But I honestly think that I have found the answer to what I'm looking for there. My my current uh, iPad, I got a 2019 entry level iPad, so it has, you know, basically all the latest all the all the latest stuff that I could possibly want. I don't game on my iPad. I don't do any kind of video editing on my iPad. So I, it's good for a long time. It's future-proofed for a long time. I got that, and I got a smart keyboard, and that is really... I don't have a yearning anymore to load up on all that other kind of tech. I really don't. So it's not that kind of tech that I'm talking about. Instead, it's two other kinds of tech. I mentioned the other day, I made just a, an offhand reference here that one of you brought up to me in, in email, the idea of a rice cooker as a device to put on the kitchen counter uh, where no rice cooker currently exists. And I have been researching them. I did a ton of research on YouTube, but it occurred to me that if I'm researching these things, I should ask you. I trust you more than I trust YouTube. And I, what I have seen is that they are these are discrete little things. It's a cooking unit, basically a pressure cooker with an in, a detachable inside bucket. Put the bucket, you put the rice in that bucket, you add cups of water to that, you close the thing, you plug it in, and it cooks the rice. And you check back when it's done. Very, very simple. Uh, and I've been watching a million videos on those, mostly by insufferable people. I don't know who it is who owns rice cookers. Am I going to become even more insufferable if I get one? But what I've been seeing is that even the simplest ones, even the most basic ones, also have a lot more capability than just rice. Obviously, they can steam all sorts of things. 
So that's very interesting. And I think I am going to get one of those things, but I want to put it to you. Feel free in the comments field or in emails to flood me with more information. First-hand information is so much better for me than YouTube videos showing me things. Uh, I even went to Amazon and did a preliminary search to, for what one of these things might cost me. Because I was thinking about getting, I'm thinking about getting one of these things now, especially if it can double as a vegetable steamer or something like that. So feel free <laughs> to tell me all about it. I made mention when I, when I first, when the subject first came up that I am uh, somewhat limited in the kitchen by uh, this, the specific kind of neuropathy that I have that really, I really don't have much of a sense of touch. So I, for instance, can't chop things with a sharp knife in the kitchen. Absolutely cannot do that. And, and, and the stove is very, very tricky because you, the stove and freshly heated pots and freshly heated plates and whatnot are very, very tricky. You, you might think not, but uh, you, I, those of you who have a full, the full complement of sense of touch in your hands and your face and your neck and whatnot, uh, might not realize how much you're relying on it without thinking about it. And if it were taken away, it makes you extra cautious. And I have already determined from looking at these rice cooker things that they cannot hurt me in any way. They are completely simple, completely simple. So that's one piece of tech. It's not technological tech, but I am very much looking into that. I think I will get one of those. And now I'm just curious to know what the ins and outs of them are, uh, which one to get, what kind of thing to get. I don't obviously want it to be too complicated because that would defeat the purpose right there. But the other piece of tech involves writing <laughs> because I mentioned yesterday uh, in a tag that I loved using my manual typewriter. My fa I still have my father's manual typewriter. Just a, an old school manual typewriter. I'd have to get ribbons for it. I'm sure that the ribbon, the ribbon that's in it is 30 years old, so I'm sure that it doesn't work anymore, and I don't have any others, and I have no idea. But now that the internet exists, I imagine getting ribbons for any kind of typewriter is probably comparatively easy. I probably don't have to schlep all, all the way to Western Massachusetts to get some in a specialty shop with an insufferable owner. But I was mentioning, I mentioned the other day that I would love to write on my typewriter, but that it doesn't go anywhere. You write on a typewriter, you pull the page out, and there's, it's just a page sitting there. It doesn't do any good. You can't edit it. You can't send it to anybody. And uh, you bombarded me with possibilities, two in particular. One, a few of you sent me links to, apparently there are devices, there are, there are mechanical typewriter keyboards into which the, you insert your iPad. And it connects blue, to, via Bluetooth, and it is a Bluetooth keyboard, but it is set up so that the iPad looks like a piece, of, a piece of paper in the typewriter, and you just type that way, and it appears on the screen. Some of them are fairly pricey, so I, I, I again, I would want to know how they work, rather than lay out $300 for something that, it turns out, bounces all over the table and is cheaply made. That was one thing. That is fascinating, to be able to do, to get a Bluetooth keyboard that mimics a manual typewriter, I hadn't even thought of that. And that is fascinating to think about that. And the other thing uh, comes at the problem from the other end, which is uh, to either download an app or use an app that's already on my iPhone to scan manually typewritten pages of text in, in transform them into PDFs that can be edited, that can be changed, and that can be sent to other people. And again, I am putting myself before the rest of you. I can research this until the cows come home, but what I want to hear is I want to hear from you, from people who actually do this sort of thing. I'm worried with this scanning thing, the, the, the mechanical typewriter keyboard, the main thing I'm worried about is that they will look sturdy but not be sturdy. The thing I was singing the praises of with the manual typewriter is that you can pound on it. I won't want one of these things if I can't pound on it because I already have keyboards that I can't pound on. And I like them just fine, but... If I'm going to go that way, but the other way, the scanning of the end result, that strikes me as very promising because that is my typewriter. That is not me using some new keyboard. That is me using machine that I know like a limb of my body, only suddenly producing things that can be shared. That would be incredible. My main worry is that the conversion process of the typed page to a PDF would be riddled with tiny little typos. I, I might love the idea, but it won't be any use to me if I am giving myself uh, an hour per page of extremely detailed word count, uh, a copy editing. 
I don't want to be able, I don't want to have to do that. I don't want the page to be riddled with, with mistakes because the scanning process went wrong. So I need to investigate that. But the idea, the mere prospect in 2021 of setting up a, a, a bench, a stool is what I used to use, and sitting forward on the couch and typing on my typewriter and using technology to get that to the outside world. Oh my God, that prospect is so incredible. It's so incredible. It just blows my mind. So I wanted to give you an update. I am thinking about both of those. I'm leaning towards the scanning end because that is technology that I already have. The only element that's missing from that combination is a working ribbon, <laughs> which I think I can probably get. Uh, but either way, I would love to hear from you. Your thoughts on that, your advice on that, anything like that. Most of you have been watching this channel for a long time, so you know me fairly well. You're going to know what's going to bother me, what's going to give me trouble, that sort of thing. Feel free to tell me all about it, because that is deeply, deeply intriguing. Uh, and then the next mega stuff thing is about NaNoWriMo. I thought I'd give you a NaNoWriMo update, National Novel Writing Month. I tried to update my uh, word count early this morning, and the site seemed to be down. I'll have to try later today and make sure that it's all uh, completely accurate. But I am do I am doing a NaNoWriMo story. I'm doing a, a science fiction epic uh, uh, that has fa some fairly standard gimmicks in it. Uh, uh, an artifact found on a world, found buried on a world that is a, actually a remnant of um, far superior technology and that can cause all sorts of havoc. You've all read science fiction stories like that before. So have I. Nothing completely wrong with that. It's all about the execution. Uh, and I've been having a blast by pantsing my way through this NaNoWriMo. That is seat of the pants. I had, I, I didn't, I ran out of time to plot and plan a story. I had planned a couple of them and they just did not interest me at all. Which brought me right to the edge of the start of NaNoWriMo with no plot. And I decided that, well, I can either give up on NaNoWriMo for this year or I can go and do what better than half the people who participate in NaNoWriMo do, which is to go in without a plot. So I did. I am a pantser. <laughs> and, and I have noticed uh, two things. One, nobody ever really pantses. You're, you're plotting a little bit ahead of where you're going at all times. A famous writer once described writing a novel plot or no plot, uh, as driving at night and you can only see as far as the headlight beams of your car and nothing else. Uh, I'm finding that largely to be true, so I'm not so much concerned with the difference between pantsing and plotting anymore. The other thing I'm finding, though, especially now as I dig into the meat of my story, you know, the beginning parts of a science fiction space opera, you want to hook the reader. But sooner or later, you're going to have to have people explain things, and that takes research, and that takes time. That, I am starting now just to approach the part of this story where my characters are going to have to know at least something of what they're talking about. I'm going to have to do a little bit of research. And if I had plotted, I wouldn't have to do that. I would have done that all ahead of time. Instead, I'm going to have to factor that into the writing day. I'm wondering how that will go. It just started today. But it's going to get worse. I know it's going to get worse. Before it gets better. I mean, I, I anticipate about a week where I will have fairly exposition-heavy chapters. And after that, my reader will know as much as I want them to know. <laughs> so, so I will. After that, I imagine we'll be off to the races. But I'm curious to see now. I'm right at the edge of knowing this is the weakness of pantsing. Is that you can start to slow down because you have to do extra, uh, extracurricular research that isn't the writing process. I thought about that before I started. I thought, well, you know, the way to avoid that is to set up a story that is told entirely in the present contemporary world, something that doesn't require research. And I opted against it. So we will see. We'll see if I regret that. But that's your NaNoWriMo update, is that I'm having a blast with NaNoWriMo. The very last thing that I thought. I thought that if I ever did a NaNoWriMo pantsing, I would be miserable the whole time. And instead, I actually think some of the stuff that I'm doing is good. So, <laughs> so NaNoWriMo is still cautiously very happy about it. And then the last um, mega stuff thing is that we have a little mail. We have uh, two packages of mail. Uh, and then we'll be done. So this doesn't have to be 40 minutes. Uh, so, and these are both really thin. The packages themselves are very thin. So, and Steve doesn't like thin uh, book packages. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what, what goes on here. Uh, okay, so uh, this next one comes out on December 1st. It is, once again, another example of the bombardment of literature in translation that we have seen on this channel in the year 2020. Ten times more in 2020 than I saw in the last four years combined. Uh, this is I'm Staying Here, 
a novel by Marco Balzano, translated, I presume, from the Italian by Jill Folston. I'm staying here. Uh, let's see what we can do for the light. Oh, no, that makes it worse. All right, that's better. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we got a description. A woman recounts a life of impossible choices to her long-lost daughter in this sweeping historical novel. Well, very sweeping. Uh, by internationally best-selling author Marco Balzano in his English debut. Oh, my. Okay, first time in English. Good for him. Based in the small Italian village of Curon, which once existed on the border of Switzerland and Austria, this novel reveals the little-known stories of the displaced Germans living in Italy during World War II and a community divided as Italian fascism and then Nazism took over. Oh, we're ending as we began, aren't we? In 1923, 17-year-old Trina was eager to start her teaching career when fascism swiftly conquered her village. I did not see this coming. Obviously, you know that, because this was in a packed envelope. This is just chance, that's all. Uh, putting up one of the first of many ideological walls between residents and interrupting Curon's simple way of life. Along with the obligatory holidays, curfews, and other restrictions under Mussolini's rule, teaching, or even speaking in German, was strictly forbidden. Undaunted, Trina joined a network of underground schools, constantly risking capture to teach German. Finding moments of joy with her students and her family, she managed to build a life and a family with Eric, a kindly young man uh, who worked with her father. In 1939, Trina's life was once again thrown into uncertainty when Hitler's Germany offered communities like hers the quote-unquote great option to leave Italy and join the Reich. Trina and others who chose to stay were viewed as traitors or spies. This political divide bared itself out as the personal rupture as her son welcomed the Nazis marching on the town, her daughter disparaged the limits of life under Mussolini, and her husband was drafted into World War II. Okay, I can't actually take any more, so I'm going to stop reading. Uh, this comes out on the 1st of December. Another translated work. Goes on my list right away. Uh, as we wind down, we uh, approach the winding down of the year. Uh, then we'll move on to the next one. Also very thin. Uh, I can't read any more of I'm Staying Here. Because <laughs> I like my book club. Uh, let's see. What, what, oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. We've already seen this. This is the finished copy. <laughs> this comes out in a week. Quite a few of you are going to be more enthused about it than I am. It's going to be uh, $24. You're all going to want to buy it. Those of you who are guilty are going to want to buy it. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm glad to show it to you anyway. Although calling it not my cup of tea is an insult to, to cups of tea everywhere. This is by John Gray, and this is Feline Philosophy, Cats, and the Meaning of Life. <laughs> Let's give it a read through, shall we? <laughs> it's not a long thing, but all of you cat people have got to have this, obviously. <laughs> Humans are anxious, restless, distracted, and in constant search of understanding. Cats, on the other hand, live in the moment, free of dread and self-consciousness. In Feline Philosophy, Gray asserts that for an example of how to live our lives free of delusion and illusion, we should look no further than our feline companions. <laughs> so what does that mean? That instead of cleaning your own house, you're going to lounge on the couch and expect someone to come in and clean it for you, and when they come in and clean it for you, you're going to say, Oh, thank you. That was so nice of you. How about a hug? And when they come over to hug you, you're going to scratch their eyes out. <laughs> And expect them to be grateful. So expect them not only to come back the next day, but while they're home, to lovingly show the scratches to all their friends. Oh, look what she did today. I'm bleeding. <sighs> Comprised of sections on philosophers' failed attempts to make life less torturous, Cat's ancient Egyptian history, and the literature's most beloved feline tales, the book concludes with a helpful list of ten feline hints on how to live well. <laughs> Having learned quite a deal from his own cats over the course of his life, Gray deviates from his usual somber cynicism, taking philosophy to a new and playful realm with feline philosophy. <laughs> All right. All right, so I, those of you who are watching, I think are probably split right down the middle. One half of you are right now saying, oh, I have to get that book. And the other half of you are right now saying, oh, I really want to read Steve's review of that book. <laughs> uh, so you can both be satisfied. This comes out in a week. It's a $24 hardcover. 
feline philosophy. I will certainly be reviewing it. <laughs> I have reviewed John Gray before. I have not liked him as an author. This is obviously a very different kettle of fish. This is obviously him being as close to playful as someone who calls himself a philosopher ever gets. Um, <laughs> that was the bean bursting her way into the room, no doubt, because she knew what we were talking about. <laughs> I can't believe this is coming to me, of all people. But a lot of you are going to want this. Now you know that it exists. Uh, so we have Feline Philosophy and I'm Staying Here. Uh, I'm Staying Here being the author's first novel translated into English about a little village that didn't really think that the people who warned it were being serious, who thought those warnings were hyperbolic. And then suddenly it was too late. And uh, the key thing to remember, as well we'll end as we began, the key thing to remember about something being too late is that when things are too late, that means it's too late. <laughs> the key is to act before it's too late. Because once it's too late, it's too late. <laughs> so I guess that 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 is, I'm of course talking about I'm staying here. What else could I be talking about? So there you go. That is your mega stuff video for today. We have a joyous report on NaNoWriMo, my thoughts about the, the 2020 U.S. elections, and a call in the meantime for all of you to flood me with what you know about rice cookers and about scanning printed documents into working PDFs. That's basically what I'm talking about here. It doesn't have to come out of a manual typewriter. Uh, any, any app or function that will do it for any document will do it for what comes out of a manual typewriter. And I want to know, is it possible in 2021 for me to go back to writing on my typewriter? Oh my God, that would be incredible. So feel free to tell me all about it. But in the meantime, we're going to wrap this up before it goes much longer. And I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.